So the M2 MacBook Air has been out for just about six months now, and I figured now would be a good time to revisit this MacBook, since honestly, it's one of my favorite pieces of tech from 2022 and into 2023. I will say I noticed a lot of the initial reviews were very comparative to the MacBook Pro lines and the M1 MacBook Air, which is fine, but this MacBook is its own device that honestly deserves a dedicated, less comparative review. And some of the reviews I've seen have ripped on the MacBook Air for things it's simply not designed for. It's not trying to be a pro machine meant for the pro user. However, it's absolutely a great choice for the everyday user and some creators. I'll be real too, I simply don't care for benchmarks or in-depth technical specs, but I do care how this performs in everyday use, so hopefully I can show you how it does. I don't want to discount the fact that the previous or other models exist, so I will mention some of those things at the end, but there are some key features that make this MacBook unique. So here's the review of the M2 MacBook Air from someone who doesn't get a new MacBook every year. And if you're new here, thanks for stopping by. On this channel, I'll talk about gaming, tech, and a few things in between. So if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like or subscribe. And if you don't, next time you order a package, it'll be delayed just because. But getting into the unboxing, it's always a treat and there's not much to it. The box itself is simple in the similar Apple fashion. There's minimal branding on the side that says MacBook Air and an image of the M2 Air showing the absolute thinness of this device. Inside the box, you have the MacBook Air itself, which is wildly lightweight out of the box. And you have the new braided MagSafe cable, which is color matched to the MacBook. It's a nice touch veering away from the old solid white USB-C cables. It feels really high quality in hand and really does look great. The charger in box as well for the base model is a 30 watt charger with a type C port for the MagSafe. But for for most people, 30 watts is absolutely fine, although you can always opt in for the higher wattage for an extra charge. Lastly, you have the documentation with the stickers people like to mention but never use, and that's it. And getting this in hand, I can easily say it's by far my favorite in terms of size and aesthetic. I truly appreciate the weight and size of this MacBook coming in at just over one centimeter thick, and it's about two pounds in hand, legit less heavy than most textbooks. And like the newer MacBook Pros, they've gone with the squared off and rounded edges. I originally thought this would be uncomfortable to use, but it's actually fine. The model I have is the Midnight colorway, but it does come in Starlight, Silver, and Space Gray. The Starlight and Midnight are the new colors unique to the M2 Air, and I love them both. In some lighting situations, it almost looks black, and sometimes a deep navy, and sometimes a nice light blue, and yes, it's a fingerprint magnet, and it goes without saying, it is a premium built product. On the left side, you have two Thunderbolt 4 ports for display and peripherals, as well as the MagSafe connection, and on the right side, you only have one port being the high impedance headphone jack. The bottom does have rubber feet, which are actually pretty good at keeping it from moving around on surfaces, and on the top end, you have the classic Apple emblem. One thing I noticed is that there's zero branding on this laptop across the board. There's no deboss surfaces or branding below the screen. And personally, I prefer this. I don't really know why. And here's how it looks next to the Space Gray MacBook Pro. Again, I really dig how it looks. I will say too, turning this thing on is awesome that there's no fan at all, meaning it is literally completely silent. I will talk more about the display itself in a bit, but this is a 13.6 inch display, which I think is actually the perfect size in terms of portability. To talk about dimensions again, of all the recent MacBooks, it's definitely the smallest one available, being just under half an inch thick and only about two pounds weight wise. It's truly super lightweight and convenient, and it's the sort of MacBook you want to and can take with you just about anywhere you go. Personally, I've always been a fan of smaller tech like the iPad mini 6 and the iPhone 12 and 13 minis, so it's definitely something I really appreciate. And while the other MacBooks aren't atrociously massive or heavy, this model does have a convenience factor being so light and thin. And just taking a look at the difference between this and my MacBook Pro, the difference is noticeable in both size and weight. In terms of the 13.6 inch display, it's actually pretty good. I can't say it's anything wildly impressive, but again, it's not really trying to be. It's just a decent all around display. This is a liquid retina display, meaning it's obscenely sharp and you can't really even see individual pixels even if you tried. It does have true tone support to better display colors depending on your ambient lighting situation. Whether this looks better to you or not, that's totally subjective. When it comes down to colors though, it does look excellent while editing both video or photo and it gets plenty bright for indoor use. At 500 nits brightness, it does a great job all around. It might not do as well outdoors, but still it's very much usable. The bezels are also super thin to mention and the display goes almost edge to edge, which again is super badass considering the size of this MacBook. Quality wise, I don't really have any complaints, especially while watching content. At the top of the display, there is the notch, which is apparently giving you more space on your screen. Frankly, I don't really see the benefit of the notch, but it also doesn't really bother me at all. It could be here or not, it just would have been nice to see something like Face ID. 
The display is only 60 hertz as well, so if you're looking for high refresh, it might be something to miss, but really some people simply don't care for it. I personally love high refresh rates, but this is a feature reserved for the Pro line. When it comes down to the size of the display, again, I feel like 13.6 is the Goldilocks size for a laptop. Again, it sort of depends on what your workflow is, but for everyday stuff like web browsing, word processing, and the like, 13.6 inches is absolutely fine. If you start getting into stuff like editing timelines, it might be a little bit crunched in terms of space, but even then it's still completely usable. I always like to tinker with the scaling options on my Macs to display the most stuff, which makes this better for me. If you're curious what the size comparisons are in display, here it is compared to my 11 inch iPad and my 14.2 inch MacBook Pro. You can always hook up a display too using a Thunderbolt port, although it is rather limited and I'm not sure why Apple has made it like this. Out of the box, you can only hook up one display, but the only way around this to get two or three displays is if you use a Display Link Thunderbolt dock. The one I've been using for the last two months is from Mini Sopru, which is actually today's video sponsor. I've been actually using their products for quite some time for both my iMac and MacBooks, and the 13-in-1 dock is almost a must-have for any desk setup with the M2 or M1 MacBook Airs. As mentioned, the M2 Air only supports one monitor out of box, but this dock does enable you to use up to three displays. This dock has three ports for displays, one display port up to 4K 60Hz, one HDMI up to 4K 60 as well, and the third one is either display port or HDMI at 4K 60 as well. On this setup, I do have two gigabyte monitors. One is 4K and the other is 1440p, working absolutely flawlessly. And apart from that, you do get all the ports that aren't found on the M2 Air. On here, you have a 10 gig Ethernet port, four USB-A ports, two of which are up to five gig transfer speed, as well as two additional USB-C ports, one for 100 watt power delivery, and the other for five gigabytes per second transfer speed. Using a display link dock is the only way to get multiple displays on the MacBook Air M1 and M2. So be sure to check out this one down below in the video description. And thanks to Minisopro for sponsoring today's video. Talking about specs and performance, honestly, this MacBook performs extraordinarily well. And again, the model I'm using is the absolute base model. At the base end, the M2 Air does come with eight gigabytes of unified memory, 256 gigabytes of SSD storage, a 1080p camera, an eight core CPU, and an eight core GPU. What does that all mean? Great performance with very limited storage space. I won't bore you with benchmarks since that's not really something I care to focus on, but I do like to focus on real day-to-day -day use and it's been great. And it's surprising that even the base model has handled my entire workflow without hiccup and it's sort of made me question my 14-inch MacBook Pro. Without crazy detail, chances are if this M2 Air existed before the launch of the MacBook Pro line, I most likely would have gotten this instead. I do have to say though, the base model storage is wildly abysmal at 256 gigs. It's simply not enough even for basic workflows. So you would likely want to spec this upwards if you're doing even the smallest bit of creative work. That said, everything I've done on here has been absolutely solid. Zero throttling, lag, or crashes while editing video and photos, and obviously doing day-to-day -day things. Usually I have a good chunk of apps open all at once as well, like Final Cut Pro, Music, Safari, QuickTime, and Audacity. I think if there were any sort of performance issues, I would most likely find it while editing. And as I mentioned, it's been super clean. I can't say my edits are advanced in any way. It's usually just a single 4K layer with some basic effects or text, and scrubbing through the 4K footage is absolutely seamless. Even while exporting a finished project, it's quick to do so. My last video was a 10 minute 4K project which exported in about 7 minutes. I will say my 14 inch MacBook Pro exported it faster, but it's such a small margin unless time is literally money for you, that doesn't matter. And although it's absolutely not the reason to buy a Mac, I can say the casual game works really well on here, especially for optimized titles. I did test Diablo 3 on this 45 inch OLED which was pretty badass. And the more processor heavy games like Sims 4 are played without an issue. Again, it's not what you get it for, but it still did a good job. And I do have to mention it again, just make sure you either spec up the storage or make sure you have external SSD to work with. In terms of ports and connectivity, like I mentioned before, there's really not that much here, which for some people might be too limiting. As mentioned, there are only two Thunderbolt ports, so once you start plugging in a display, you've only got one left to plug everything else in. Assuming you already have wireless peripherals, this might be an issue. That said, it's a MacBook, meaning portability is mostly in mind, so there's less likely that you need to plug things into it, especially if you're always on the go. In terms of the MagSafe port, it's pretty handy to have, although in my use case since I'm mostly a desktop user, I've only ever really charged it through the Thunderbolt port. MagSafe does what it's designed to do either way, if ever yanked quickly the charger will pop loose. And on the right side of the Mac, you only have one port which is the high impedance headphone jack. While I mostly connect over Bluetooth, it's easy to forget the improved quality of being plugged in directly. I do recommend setting Apple Music to lossless, plugging in a good pair of headphones and giving it a try. I recently got the Sony XM5s, which are far better than I anticipated. When it comes to the keyboard and trackpad, Apple's done an excellent job. The keyboard in particular is better than I had expected. The keys are wonderfully tactile with a good amount of travel considering how thin this MacBook is. Of course, the backlit as well, which can be changed in the control center. Out of box, the keyboard is only half brightness, so just keep that in mind. I also really appreciate the 
full function rows of keys, this will never not be useful. And if you've ever used a MacBook 2, you're likely aware of how great the trackpads are. And frankly, to this day, across any laptops, simply put, Apple still does it best. The taptic clicks and feedback really makes it feel like a real button, despite not having any moving parts. And I gotta give a swift mention to Touch ID, it's just so useful and handy. I was so spoiled by this with my MacBook Pro, I ended up getting the Magic Keyboard with Touch ID. I do want to talk about the speaker, camera, and mic, since really these will be heavily used almost every day. Starting with the camera, it's fine, just fine. I'd expect it to look better for 1080p, but a laptop so thin simply can't have a larger sensor to get more light. The mic is also decent enough. It's a three mic array, where they're located I couldn't tell you, but they do the job. If you're looking to do voiceovers or any sort of higher quality work, you'll definitely want to get something a little bit higher quality. Lastly, the speakers on here are surprisingly awesome. Again, considering the size, they have no ray sounding as good as they do. And here's a quick sound test. Where are we? In terms of battery, this MacBook is rated to get 15 to 18 hours of life on a single charge. Honestly, I wanted to test this, but I gave up simply because I planned, wrote, and edited this entire video on one single charge and still ended up with 20% battery. I figured if I could do that, it's almost unrealistic to do a whole full drain. The battery is amazing, and simply put, I don't think it's something to really worry about. Charging through MagSafe, I got this from 20% to full in under 2 hours, and that was with a 30 watt brick. I imagine that's even quicker with a 67 watt charger. So coming in at $1200, it's still expensive, and while this has been a dedicated review of the M2 Air, it'd be irresponsible not to mention some alternatives. I only want to mention 3 other models, that's the M1 MacBook Air, the 14 inch MacBook Pro, and the new M2 Mac Mini. To sum it up really, the M1 Air will do everything the M2 Air does when it comes to everyday things, especially since you would be saving 200 bucks. If you're considering any sort of gaming or creative work whatsoever, I think the M2 Air is still a better option in terms of performance and future proofing. That said, if you really do need more power and all the expanded inputs and a high refresh display, you could pick up a baseline 14 inch MacBook Pro from the refurbished store for 510 bucks more. And more powerful than both of those would be the M2 Mac Mini, which again, if you're just looking for a desk setup, this could be the better option for more power. And as mentioned, if the M2 Air existed, I probably would have gotten that over my MacBook Pro. I believe it's the perfect all-around MacBook with a great balance of price to performance and aesthetic. If you need to do heavier stuff like 3D rendering or multiple 8K streams, etc., there's definitely a better option for you, and frankly, you might already know this isn't the MacBook for you. For anyone who has an Intel Mac or an older Windows laptop, you would see a huge leap in performance, and I don't think you'll be disappointed. Anyways, I appreciate you sticking around till the end. I'll leave everything in my setup linked down below in the video description, as well as the mini Sopru 13-in-1 docking station. Anyways, that's been it. Appreciate you sticking till the end. Till next time.